Bad Larry. Welcome back, Bad Larry Kingdom. I'm your host, Bad Larry, and today we're checking out The Tomb of Dracula, number one, Night of the Vampire. This is actually a Marvel release, Stanley production. Writer is Jerry Conway and Roy Thomas. The cover artist is Neil Adams. This was published in April of 1972. And I tell you what, folks, the feeling of this issue is very much in that 1970s vibe. The relationship between men and women, art style, the writing style, it's very much in that early 70s vibe. This isn't a joke series. This is a 70 issue horror epic. And stay with me, folks, past issue number seven. From what I've been told, after issue number seven, it gets really, really good. So let's check it out. It's interesting this first page has R.I.P. Stan Lee. To set the tone, we're seeing the image of Castle, Count Dracula. The weather, the lightning, everything, nature is trying to warn everybody to stay away from this building. To set the tone, there is a lot of drama. Nature itself is trying to destroy this castle and try to keep anyone from being able to access it. Our protagonist's name is Frank Drake, aka Frankie or aka Drake. And he's brought his girlfriend along, Jeannie, and Clifton, who also used to be Jeannie's lover. So we have a bit of a lover's triangle here. Frank Drank has rented a Jeep and is on his way to Castle Dracula, which he inherited. And he's thinking of selling or turning into some sort of tourist trap. And despite the rain, despite all of the hazardous conditions, he's insistent on making it to the castle. Clifton says, hey, Frankie, buddy, let's turn around. Let's stop and... Frankie's like, shut up, Clifton. Frankie tells Clifton somehow he feels like he knows this road. It's like part of him. And of course, they crash. Clifton mocks Frankie. Oh, I know the road so well. <laughs> Frankie snaps back at Clifton and says, shut up, Clifton. I'm in charge here, buddy. Clifton responds, all right, big brain boss man. What are we going to do now? We're all broken down with no one to call and no help. So these three are going to have to walk their wet asses back to Transylvania on foot and somehow they're all blaming Clifton for his bad attitude. Transylvania is literally a ghost town. They've got no industry. The barmaid, the innkeeper, they're all kind of excited for the arrival of Frank Drake and his friends. They think that his uh, taking over Count Dracula's castle is going to bring some money, some tourism. They're going to be rich. Frank Drake is asking the old mate with the pipe and the vest if anyone has a carriage that can take him up to Count Dracula's castle. And the old mate with the pipe says, nah, ain't no one's gonna help you. We don't wish you any harm, but there's a vampire that lives up there and uh, we're not about to help you go up there and kill yourself. And the old mate with the white hair is like, well, if the money's right, I'll take you up there. And the barmaid's like, yeah, you better watch out. If you go up there, you're probably gonna die because there's a vampire that lives up there. And all made with the carriage is like, ah, don't listen to her. She's just a foolish girl. Otto, the old maid driving the carriage with the white hair, is telling Frank and his companions, you know, I don't believe in superstition. I don't believe in all that nonsense. But uh, this is about as far as I'm going to take you, okay? Y'all got to get out and walk because I ain't going any farther. But I don't believe in superstition and all that. Frank Drake, he's the ginger in the tan overcoat. He's so focused on his mission to get to Castle Dracula that he's not even witnessing and paying attention to the betrayal that's happening right behind him. While the rain is pouring down, Clifton has grabbed Jeannie, his girl, and is like, hey, while well, Frank's not paying attention, why don't you and I make up, you know what I mean? Wink, wink. Jeannie promptly tells Clifton to go kick rocks. Frank Drake is having a flashback of when he had a million dollars and within three years he blew it and how he kind of stole Jeannie from Clifton and even though he's his friend he can't ever really trust Clifton again and he went to his other friends looking for a loan and his friends are like sorry buddy uh your credit sucks I can't give you no money and so this is why he's so motivated to get to this castle Dracula and make some cash because he was a millionaire and he blew it all this is how this horror epic begins Frank is whining to Clifton about how he can't get a loan because the 
only collateral he has is the old Castle Dracula. Clifton says, wait, what? You have a castle? How do you have a castle? Frank tells Clifton that his dad inherited the castle. His family's original name was Dracula. He's a direct descendant of Dracula, and they changed their family name to Drake. Clifton says, Frank, baby, your money woes are over. You've got a castle. It's ready made for the tourist industry. Let's ready to get rich again, baby. Clifton hands Frank a book and says, you gotta read this. This is your family history. Your Dracula history will use it for the tourism. You gotta get familiar with the Dracula family lore. As Frank starts reading the diary, he feels more and more connected to Count Dracula. He says he can almost see him in the words of the pages. He sees that Dracula is a tall man, gaunt, his eyes like obsidian stone. The first entry speaks of how Dracula's prey of choice is the young white girl. The younger, the wider, the better. After three dozen pages, the handwriting changes to a younger man, Dracula's grandson. And the grandson speaks about how Dracula is always being creepy in the windows. He's always creeping around. And finally, the handwriting changes to a man named Van Helfing. And Van Helfing apparently snuck up on Dracula when he was sleeping and drove a stake through his heart, killing Dracula. After a few days, Clifton comes back and asks Frank if he's ready to turn that castle into a museum. And Frank says, yep, let's do it, buddy. It's all I've been thinking about for the last few days. He brings along Jeannie, and he never wonders why Clifton has been so helpful in getting Frank back on his feet. This idea of turning the castle into a museum and this whole business idea, considering that he literally stole Clifton's girlfriend. But back in the present, the trio have arrived at the gates of the castle. Clifton's like, yeah, the castle, all right. Isn't it make you sort of choked up there, Frankie boy? Frankie tells Clifton to shut up, Clifton. For some reason, he's still super Super pissed at Clifton. Probably because the start of this adventure, this business adventure, has been a total shit show so far, and it's been Clifton's idea to begin with. As the trio enter the castle, Clifton is fully immersed into the experience. He feels like he knows this castle. He feels like he knows the ins and outs of it. It's in his blood. Jeannie, on the other hand, is feeling some sort of way about this place. She's scared shitless. Suddenly, a bunch of bats come out of nowhere. Jeannie screams, which awakens Frank out of the trance that he's been in. Clifton's like, oh, okay, the bats are gone. And Frank tells Clifton to shut up. He's really giving him the Rod Rodney Dangerfield experience. He gets no respect, this Clifton character. Jeannie is ready to get the hell out of Dodge. This place is giving her the eebie-jeebies. Jeannie pulls out a silver compact to remind her of how Frank used to be. He gave her this real expensive mirror. She knows that he's dead-ass broke, but now that they're in this castle, she's thinking that Frank has changed. He's different somehow. As Clifton starts to wander off onto his own exploring the castle. He's thinking, how could he have ever fallen for such a dumbass broad like Jeannie? He takes a step and he falls his ass through the floor. Apparently, Clifton is pretty familiar with the layout of this castle and he knows that he's close to the dungeon and he walks down and he's saying, that fool Frankie, we find out that Clifton has had an ulterior plan all along. He wants to take the girl, take the castle, and take everything. Old mate Clifton stumbles upon Count Dracula's crypt and says to himself, I wonder what's inside there. Let me check it out. As Clifton strikes another match and lights the candelabra, he opens the coffin, and to his surprise, he finds the real McCoy, Dracula. This guy's hit the jackpot, he thinks, in the bonehead move of the entire century. Clifton decides to remove the stake from Dracula's heart. He removes it, and he just... It's like, okay, I'm gonna go knock off Frankie and become the sole proprietor of this here castle. And then he starts to hear, whoa, what's that? What's that going on behind me? Dracula, in a mere instant, has put himself back together. Dracula lives again. Clifton turns around, he screams, no! Dracula says to Clifton, thank you for taking the stake out of my heart. I have been incapacitated for many years and have the thirst for the white woman's blood. Clifton had planned to use this gun on Frankie to try to steal a castle, but now, in a fit of fear, he blasts Dracula, but it has no effect on Dracula. Dracula says, oh, your little pew-pew shooter has no effect on me. Down the hole you go, you little bitch. I am not in the dudes like that, like Puff Daddy, but I might snack on you later if I'm feeling a bit peckish. Dracula sniffs around. He says, Hmm, my castle is no longer empty. 
Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of a white woman. Elsewhere in the castle, Frankie and Jeannie are looking for Clifton. Jeannie tells Frank, I think he went this way. Follow me. Oh no, there's a hole in the floor. There's a bat. Oh no, Frankie, keep it away from me. This is no ordinary bat. This bat has transformed into Count Dracula. And he's been incapacitated for many years and he's full of the pimp juice. Count Dracula uses his magic eye hypnotism and says, My alabaster beauty, come to me, come to pimp Count Dracula. And the white women, they just can't resist him. Jeannie swings Frank away and says, I must go to him. Well, Frank is a descendant of Dracula and also has the pimp juice coursing through his veins. He pimp slaps Jeannie into oblivion and tells Dracula, this white woman is mine. He shines the silver mirror at Dracula, his shadow. He can't take it. He flies into a bat and flies away so far. It's Frank 1, Dracula 0. Frank quickly realizes it must be the silver in the mirror that has repulsed Dracula. And then he also realizes that Clifton must be dead. It's been over a hundred years since Dracula has tasted that sweet, sweet nectar of the white woman. And as he's flying around as a bat, he finds one of his precious prey. It says, don't mind if I do. He pounces, quickly devours her and flies away. The townspeople quickly find the barmaid and see that she has the mark of the vampire and they're saying, oh no, not again, it's been a hundred years. Everybody, go protect your white women, go hide them, lock them up, lock them up. Dracula's on the hunt again. The townspeople aren't gonna have it. They wanna protect their white women and they get their pitchforks and their fire ready. Dracula as a bat has flown back to the castle unawares that the townspeople are also on the way to the castle. Even though Count Dracula has just devoured the barmaid's blood, he said she tasted like sour grapes. But this one, Jeannie, he sees that her blood is gonna be delicious. And as he creeps up, he doesn't see the gold cross around her neck. As the Count appears to pounce on Jeannie's neck, the gold cross repulses him. He jitters back as Frank Drake enters the room with his special silver mirror and says, Back off, Dracula. This is my white woman, I said. Dracula says to Frank, You fool cousin, why do you fight me? I can smell the pimp juices alive in you. Soon you'll be just like me. And Frank is pissed. He says, I'll never be like you. And he throws his special mirror. And Count Dracula, why would you relinquish your one weapon that you know is effective against a vampire? Now he's relinquished it. Dracula shakes it off. He's like, how dare you strike Count Dracula? Now your neck is mine to snap if I wish. As Jeannie awakens, she sees that Frank is knocked out and Dracula is standing over him and he's about to pounce on her. She's super scared, but the villagers are on their way. Dracula creeps up on Jeannie at a slow pace and says, My buxom blanco beauty brunette baby. Why don't you toss that little cross bobble out the window and we can have a cuddle? Count Dracula is a black belt in pimp juice power of persuasion. So Jeannie does just as he asks and tosses her necklace with the cross out the window. She's in for it. The villagers have found Jeannie's cross and says, oh no, this is the white woman's. She's a goner. We've got to burn the castle. The Transylvania villagers start to burn the castle with the flames. As Frank wakes up, he grabs the silver mirror and shines it again at Count Dracula. Count Dracula is super annoyed. He says, if you were not my blood, I would have definitely snapped your neck. This stupid silver compact keeps driving me away. I'm super annoyed at it and you. Dracula has turned himself into a bat and says, I'm out of here. If this place burns, so be it. I'm Count Dracula. I'll find another castle. No big deal to me. Frank is under pressure. He knows that his friend Clifton is surely dead because this place is going up like a tinderbox. But he has a chance to save Jeannie. He picks her up and with all his strength, he carries is around. He's trying to give her CPR, but he fears that she's dead. He starts to cry. She's a goner. But then he hears 
Frankie, Frankie, don't cry. Frankie looks up and oh no, Dracula got to Jeannie's neck before he could save her. This bitch has turned into a vampire. Frank has taken some super massive L's today. He not only lost the castle, which was going to be his money maker. He lost Clifton, which was his best friend, even though Clifton was planning to murder him, but he didn't know that. And he lost his fiance. This chick has now turned into a vampire and has abandoned him and decided to follow along in the trails of Dracula. He's sitting there all alone, crying to his hands. He has literally got nothing left. Be on the lookout for Dracula number two titled Who Stole My Coffin? And make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and make a comment below. Thanks, I'll see you in the next 